We're here to talk about the concept of community. This is a definition of community that was offered to me back in 1985, and it's one that I use as a framework for my own work and that of the agency that I work for. And you'll see that this definition of community is what one would say is of an associational nature. But the other important thing is the term social place. So we're talking about community as not just being a, a physical resource, but also a social resource. The concept of asset-based community development is a concept that's being fairly widely used now uh, within community development and perhaps more recently in the area of disability. And John McKnight and Jody Kretzman has provided great assistance to us in this area. The community comprises of many, many, many opportunities for community inclusion and community participation. Inclusion Works, the organisation which I have the greatest pleasure to work for, our business is about transforming communities based on the gifts and talents of individuals with a disability. In fact, we measure the success of our work by the feedback we get from community as to the contribution that the individual with a disability has given back to the community. Our work is based on three primary uh, foundation principles. But let's just look at the first one. Do you believe that we believe in that equally for everybody? I think quite often we believe that this is suitable for some people, but not for other people. And whether that's conscious or unconscious, I think there's a possibility that we do that. What about the second foundation principle? We added a word to that. Some. Yeah, we were terribly romantic. Absolutely romantic about the world is going to embrace this thing called community inclusion. But we decided that that wasn't um, the case, so we go looking for the right people at the right time to do the asking. The third one is that you need to let go. How can we expect community to actually be part of the community inclusion process if services are spending a lot of time actually interfering with that process? I believe leadership is about stepping backwards and in doing that, allowing people to, in fact, step forward. I'd like to introduce you to Rick Nelson. Rick Nelson was brought to our attention late on a Friday afternoon by the matron of a local nursing home, saying, Rick, I'm not too sure whether you can help us or not. We have a young man who resides with us. Uh, he's 30 years of age, and he's in an old person's facility. We think that you might be able to assist us to actually identify something that's more relevant to his needs. He's displaying some significant behaviour problems. In fact, he was able to um, somehow kick his way out of the back doors of an ambulance and land on the road. Um, he was very, very pleased with that accomplishment. <laughs> but a lot of his behaviour was actually in response to a later quote that he gave me, you can only tolerate a certain amount of bingo. <laughs> so Rick lives in a room, single bed, um, bathroom going off it, small desk, with a computer, with a bookshelf, with no books. Rick has been living there for, I think it was about seven months at that stage. Rick's health status was exceptionally fragile. Um, we were informed that Rick had six months to live. His communication was limited. His physical health was uh, exceptionally vulnerable. His mobility needs um, required assistance. I gathered Andrew, uh, who was one of the community development workers, and we went off to meet um, Rick. We walked into Rick's room and um, we didn't need to be rocket scientists to know what his passion was because he had posters of Harley Davidson motorbikes and naked women. <laughs> that was the first challenge we had. We said, um, Rick, what's your interest? Is it Harley Davidson motorbikes or naked women? Uh, Rick's communication was by way of blinking. He blinked twice. <laughs> but his primary interest was in fact Harley Davidson motorbikes. So we went looking for the most appropriate opportunity for him to build his interest and his passion and his relationships within the motorbike community. Townsville has six motorbike clubs, five of which are known to the police. <laughs> and the sixth one is an interesting group. It's a worldwide organisation called HOGS. And there was a movie just recently, I think, about the, uh, about the HOGS group, Harley Owners Group. The HOGS group is a social place for Rick to connect to. So Andrew, being young and also riding a motorbike, started to do some inquiring. And he made uh, contact with a guy called Duffy, who's the power broker. The power broker is the mover and shaker, the one who has the greatest influence within the group. 
he rang up Duffy and said, hey, Duffy, um, there's a guy I know called Rick and he has a passion for Harley Davidson motorbikes. You know, he knows the difference between a fat boy and a road runner and da-da-da-da, going on and on. I was wondering whether there's an opportunity for him to meet you and meet the members of the Hogs group. And Duffy said, sure, Rick can go for a ride with us on Sunday. We're going for a day ride, leaving at 5.30 from um, Queen's Park. Andrew said, oh, look, um, he actually can't go on a bike at the moment. He hasn't mentioned his disability at all. Oh, that's all right, he can go in a sidecar then. You know, we've got a couple of sidecars going or, you know, hop in the back of a bike. No, actually, he um, probably can't do that at the moment either. Well, why don't you just come down and meet us? The nursing home adjusted their roster to enable Rick to get up at 3.30 to be prepared for a 5.30 meeting at Queen's Park in Townsville to meet the 60 Hardy Davidson motorbikes. I wasn't there, but I believe that Rick's smile was a strong indicator of what he was experiencing. The smell of Harley Davidson motorbikes being around pe people who share the same interest and the opportunity to link with that group. Andrew provided a good role model. He assisted Duffy on how to communicate with Rick and Duffy proceeded to introduce Rick to all the various members. Um, when it got time to go, Duffy said to Rick, uh, Rick, would you please send us on our way by using the salute? And Rick didn't know what that meant, so uh, Duffy leant down apparently and whispered in his ear and Rick smiled and Rick gave the salute. <laughs> and off they went. So do you think, you know, it's a pretty good story, isn't it? But I said we'd failed. And Andrew was really, really angry with me. And he said, why do you think we failed? And I said, well, where are we going? I mean, where does this single event take us in building relationships? So we went back to the drawing board and we went back to John McKnight's definition of community, actually, and the answer was there. It was local enterprises because somebody sold Harley Davidson's. And guess who was the mechanic, the chief mechanic in the back room of Harley Davidson? It was Duffy. So Andrew approached Duffy and said to Duffy, Duffy, do you think there's any possibility that Rick could hang around the shop? So Rick, every Saturday morning, went to the Orm Snell's Harley Davidson shop. The reason why he went on Saturday mornings was that was when the club met. They met within the perimeters of the shop. So Andrew spent a considerable amount of time in supporting uh, Rick uh, by role modelling, etc. once again. After a number of months, how, did, how long did Rick have to live? Three months. So he'd already passed his so-called use-by date. The club approached us and said, I would like Rick to be a member. And we'd done our 60-40 research and we said, I'm sorry, but Rick can't be a member because we've studied the constitution of the Harley Owners Group and we know that you have to own a Harley Davidson to be a member of the group. They changed the constitution. Now, the Harley Owners Group is an international organisation based in America. They had to negotiate with the headquarters of the Harley Owners Group to get approval and permission to change the constitution. Now, what does that tell you about what the club's perception was of Rick's um, contribution and membership to that program. When it was his birthday, a few of the uh, guys took him out for his um, birthday. I rang up the matron the next day. And I said, how'd he go, matron? You know, what happened? Everything OK, matron? And uh, she said, Rick, I don't know what they got up to, but Rick got back at 3 o'clock this morning. <laughs> and he hasn't stopped smiling since. But also we have an opportunity and responsibility to actually challenge Rick in some ways in regards to his uh, role and responsibility. And I said to Rick, uh, Rick, when are you going to pull your finger out? It's quite obvious that, you know, that you're playing a significant role in the life of this group, but there are some rituals within this club that I haven't seen you um, fulfilling any leadership around. When was the last time you put on drinks? And he thought, you know, you could see his mind ticking away, but I'm in a Uniting Church Aid Care Facility. <laughs> and I said, that's all right. Why not drinks at 10 o'clock Sunday morning? So Rick and I went to the matron and Rick indicated that he'd like some drinks, some uh, slabs of beer to be provided on ice um, under the, what do you call it, the little shelter thing in the middle of the courtyard on Sunday morning. The matron thought that was wonderful. So Sunday morning... I think it was 70 Harley Davidsons turned up. <laughs> Once again, I wasn't there, but the description I received back from the staff was that you could hear the locks on the doors. <laughs> but after a while, some of the doors opened and some of the blinds opened, and a number of older people on their walking frames and their wheelchairs 
moved forward to invade Rick's party. Rick was really pissed off. <laughs> that was his party. You know. But one of the most moving things about this story was why that happened. These people were some of the original motorbike riders. So no matter what the circumstances are, when we share a common interest, the issue of difference becomes invisible. Rick's communication was also somewhat limited. They approached us and said, you know, is there any advice that you can give us? We're not speech pathologists. Um, so we went to seek the advice of a speech pathologist. The speech pathologist came up with a particular uh, light rider speaking device and introduced that to Rick. By the way, this is now over 12 months. And this device is there and there are all these buttons and these words and there are two no's. I looked at the, the dots and um, said, well, Rick, um, there are two no's here. You know, what's all that about? And he smiled and um, pushed the first button. Now, I don't know you know much about these light riders, but they actually require a voice to be transferred onto them. Now, who do you think was the voice? Duffy. What a great honour. So I hit the button and there's the most eloquent response by Duffy saying, no. <laughs> I never heard Duffy speak like that in his whole life. He must have practised for days, you know, to get that right. No. And Rick's got this magnificent grin on his face. And I said, you know, what's the, what's the second one for? And he indicated for me to push it. And I pushed it and it said, fuck off. <laughs> Rick passed away uh, fairly suddenly. He passed away in the presence of not every one of the uh, bikies, but of half a dozen of his close friends. Andrew was really angry because there was so much more that could have been done in Rick's life and so much more that could have been done in the life of the club. So he went to the funeral and Morley's funeral chamber in Townsville, you know, fairly standard funeral parlour type thing. On one side there was over a hundred bikies, all wearing their leather jackets, but on the other side of the chapel there were seven members of his family. And we squeezed in with the bikies and I knocked Andrew in the ribs and I said, you think we were um, unsuccessful? When Duffy gave the eulogy about Rick, and despite Rick's obvious disability characteristics, there was not one mention about his um, disability. And I've been to lots of funerals and disability is always mentioned. There was no mention of his disability. But his passion for Harley Davidson motorbikes, his passion for um, Bundy and Coke, and his passion for naked women. <laughs> this is what we learned. The foundation principles that drives the service. We were getting evidence back through our work with uh, Rick of his contribution to the club, of the capacity of the community to welcome, and our capacity to let go. So our work is, is sandwiched between a mission. Our work is sandwiched between guiding principles. Our work is about planning, connecting and letting go. Our work is about maintaining a community building model as distinct from a social service model. But probably most important is that we're guided very much by a very popular <laughs> academic. <laughs> Unfortunately, she gets more and more unpopular, you know. <laughs> There's not a quote I believe more powerful, and this is what back in 1998 when I first heard this, that's relevant to our work today. If you're an optimist, by the way, we know what it means. If you're a pessimist, it's also possible to do harm. But everything that is, ladies and gentlemen, could be otherwise. Thank you very much.